have the talent to repeat, but we must realize this. Winning again is not going to be easy. It's going to be tough. Believe me. Red Sox captain Carl Yastrzemski didn't realize how much of a prophet he was back in spring training, but Yaz had been this route before. He knew there would be days of frustration, days when nothing would go right. This time, the brakes could go the other way. Experience told him the winning of a second straight pennant could be a rocky ride. Even though the experts had made the Red Sox top-heavy favorites to repeat, there would be no easy road ahead. The alarm Yaz sounded grew louder. Nearly two million fans would converge on Jersey Street for the 1976 season. Jamming the turnstiles, Fenway Park had a new look, a redone left field wall, a million dollar scoreboard providing continuous information plus instant replays of exciting action. The American League championship flag was hoisted and the hopes of players and fans rode just as high. The Red Sox started the season on an upbeat note. They did their thing with a flair during the early games. And for a short while, the team clicked. Unfortunately, 11 games into the 76 campaign, their luck turned from good to bad. It was the start of a nosedive, which would produce a 10-game losing streak. Red Sox foes could do nothing wrong, and the Red Sox, nothing right. Boston pitchers were helpless against the onslaught of some big bat. When was it all going to end? Here's House's one-two pitch to Pruitt. Ground ball to second base. Doug Griffin should handle this, and it's over. The 10-game losing streak is over, and the Red Sox come out en masse to congratulate Tommy House, who wins his first game with the Red Sox. His first victory, and I'll tell you what a relief this is. So the nightmare was over. The Red Sox responded by going on a tear, winning eight out of nine. Yankee Stadium and the first confrontation with the New York Yankees. The single by Greg Nettles moved Lou Pinello to second base and set up one of the most vicious all-out brawls of the year. Bill Lee looked in for a sign, and soon the fireworks would start. To the opposite field with a base hit. Here comes the runner. Here comes the throw. And let's see. He holds on to it. Does he hold on to it? And they have a fight. And they go from hell on this. And the bench is empty. Mickey Rivers is a guy that's trying to hit everybody with a sucker punch. 
He's not getting anything. He's just running around behind everybody trying to hit him in the back of the head. I see Shamblin's in there. I saw Bella's in here. Enrico is going to start now. Things have gotten out of hand here at Yankee Stadium. And Bill Lee is really hurt. The wild scene all began with Carlton Fitz. When I received the ball at home plate, I didn't have complete control of the ball in order to make the tag. As I was trying to gain control, I leaned into the path of the runner. Uh, Lou Pinella's knee turning, trying to knock the ball loose. I thought on his part it was an, an act of violence, uh, maybe something that was a little uncalled for. Uh, maybe even more than the Yankee rivalry situation that uh, goes from year to year. I think in light of the way we were playing, up to that time, it was, I think, more of a matter of frustration. Bill Lee, lost for two months, was the big casualty in the bruising breakout, and the spaceman had his version of what really happened to him. Clouded, I remember someone yelling, we're not trying to hurt you, as my head was being kicked in from behind, and uh, I drug myself out of the first pile, uh, looked around for my glove, and then I went after Nettles, who I remembered from my college days. And, uh, I went in there and proceeded to get uh, knocked out the second time. And uh, then I remember the umpires saying, uh, let him go, let him go. And uh, the only one that was helping was Terry Cooney. And Charlie Moss drug me out the second time. And then the fans assaulted me in the dugout. Just an average day in New York. The Red Sox weren't busting out all over when the month of June arrived. But they showed they were still capable of swinging the bat. And they did at the expense of two of the best pitchers in the league, southpaw Frank Tanana and fastball ace Nolan Ryan of the California Angels. Was this an indication that the Red Sox had finally become on track? Were they finally turning it around? The Red Sox were in Oakland on the June 15th trading deadline. Vice President and General Manager Dick O'Connell, still convinced Darrell Johnson's team could win with some help, stunned the baseball world by purchasing Oakland stars Raleigh Fingers and Joe Rudy. These two standout performers actually joined the Red Sox in uniform, but three days later this $2 million deal was voided by baseball commissioner Bowie Kuhn. Dick O'Connell explains what happened. In the middle of June, we were fairly close to the Yankees and had the hopes of overtaking them and we were trying to make a deal with several clubs particularly with the Oakland Athletics and we had tentatively set a deal of two of our players for one of his and then Mr. Finley was going to call us back the next day and said he'd like to scrap the idea of, of yesterday's proposal at that time and would now sell a bunch of ball players a group of six ball players for a certain price. He was in Chicago, I was in Oakland, he was with the head of the New York Yankees, Gay Paul, and we figured if we did not get in this market to get one or two of these ball players, we'd fall greatly behind the Yankees in the situation, not only in the field, but also public relations-wise. So therefore, we made the deal an attempt to obtain uh, Rudy and Fingers. We also had the opportunity of other ball players, which we could obtain, but uh, we thought the time this was best for the club, and we did think the deal would actually go through. We were quite sure that it would go through. We firmly, firmly believe at the present time the only thing that stopped the deal from being made was the fact that Mr. Finley put a price on it which upset not only the ball players, upset the commissioner, and upset many people in sports. And the agreement that would have gone through was no mention of price whatsoever. I firmly believe there were no questions asked, and we would have had William Fingers within the day. But the Red Sox weren't the only people in the league having their problems. It's doubtful if Cleveland's Charlie Spikes will ever forget the trouble he had chasing fly balls in Fenway Park on a windy afternoon.
Yes, things were tough all over, even for man's best friend, a dog who romped around Fenway one day to bring frustrations for some, and for others, some much-needed laughs. Despite some rough sledding, the Red Sox had a chance to get back in contention. A pivotal game in Baltimore. One out away from victory, Tony Muser's single brought Bobby Gritch to the plate. There's a long drive, left field, going back is Miller, way back is gone, and the ball game is over. This game-winning home run would not be the only sudden demoralizing blow the Sox would suffer in 76, but at the time, it was a crusher. The baseball world was stunned and saddened on July 9th when Red Sox president Tom Yawkey, one of the most respected owners in baseball for more than 40 years, passed away. This great man, a compassionate friend to all, was gone. Dick O'Connell eulogized Mr. Yawkey's death simply but eloquently. Now this past year was one of many disappointments and no doubt the most severe one of all was the loss of Tom Yawkey on the 9th of July. He'd been here for over 40 years as a fixture, one of the most beloved owners in baseball, and his passing left a very much of a void upon the whole organization, and it seemed strange to find out after he had passed away that he was no longer here, and you perhaps had nobody to call you, ask you questions, or perhaps nobody report to you for a period of time of what was taking place, and therefore I do think that baseball in Boston lost their best benefactor. The Red Sox were playing 500 baseball at the All-Star break. Then came a crucial 13-game road trip. This was to be the string of games to determine whether the Sox would be serious challengers to the first-place Yankees or fall completely out of the race. Five losses in Kansas City spelled the Red Sox doom. Manager Darrell Johnson was relieved of his job, and third-base coach Don Zimmer took over. Zimmer stirred things up. But on the last day of the trip at Yankee Stadium came the final crushing blow. And there's a long drive deep to right field. Back is Evans, and the ball game is over. Chris Chambliss had struck a three-run homer to give the Yankees a 6-5 to five triumph and a sweep of the series. Under Don Zimmer, the Red Sox became aggressive. This suicide squeeze set the tone for Zimmer's Red Sox. The gutsy former infielder, who learned his trade with the Dodgers, emphasized hustle and fundamentals. He wanted to have a 500 record by the end of the season, and he exceeded his goal. Well, when I took over this ball club, uh, I thought it was kind of a dead ball club. We wasn't running enough, and uh, the way I felt, uh, we needed some more hit and running, and uh, when you have good pitching that keeps you in ball games, you can play hit and run. And I can recall at one time where I've always wanted to hit and run uh, as a manager with the bases loaded. And one time with Bob Montgomery hitting, we had the bases loaded, three and two count, and we played hit and run. And I think that uh, this is a kind of game that I want to play, and if my players uh, can execute what I, what I want to try to do, uh, I think we'll, we'll, we'll win the games that, uh, that I think we can win. Like so many times in the past, no one contributed more to the Sox team effort than Carl Yastrzemski. He had one of the best seasons of his 16-year career. Captain Carl's home run output had been edging downward the past couple of years, but he changed that trend drastically, highlighted by a long ball spree in mid-May starting in Detroit. Carl belted one home run. Then another. But he wasn't through yet. And there's a deep drive right field. Stop going back. It's gone in the upper deck. Carl Yastrzemski has hit his third home run of the ball game. The next night in New York, he continued his onslaught against the Yankees. There's a drive deep to right field. Back goes Munson. Get on my All right. All right. Five in two days for number eight. 
Yaz led the Red Sox in runs batted in with 102, right up there among the league leaders. He used every way he knew to bring across runs, and some of them were mighty big ones. Nobody realized better the kind of a year Yastrzemski was having than his teammates. But Yastrzemski's efforts were not limited to his booming bat. He showed that he still had the hands and instincts to handle almost any job. And then when the Red Sox needed a change, Yaz went back to left field, where he showed that he still was one of the best. There was even a time when the Red Sox needed a sacrifice, and Yaz, with one of his rare bunts, did the job nicely. Carl celebrated his 37th birthday in late August, being accorded a standing ovation. He went on to celebrate the day with four hits. A target of booze far too many times in his career, Yaz finally found out what the Fenway faithful really thought of all he had done for baseball in Boston. For him, it was a heartwarming experience. Louis Tion, as usual, a dominant Fenway figure. The chant of Louis, Louis continued to echo. El Tiante used his twisting delivery and baffling assortment of pitches to dominate American League hitters. There were times when Louis also did the job with his glove. In 1975, Milwaukee's George Scott broke up Rick Wise's bid for a no-hitter. Here, with Tiant going for number 20, the Boomer did it again. The next time up, Tiant struck out Scott, setting the stage for the final out and his 20th win. One ball, two strikes to Hegan. Two out, two on. He's got it. He's got it. Louis Tion strikes out Mike Hegan at his 1 20th game. For Louis, it was the third time in the last four years he had been a 20-game winner. In Baltimore, he won his 21st. It was truly a vintage year for the colorful right-hander. Fred Lynn, to Rick Burleson, to Carlton Fisk. Although unsigned until halfway through the season, this trio gave the Red Sox fans some exciting moments. Fred Lynn, Mr. Everything in 1975, once again led the team in batting with a 314 mark. The young Californian ranged all over the outfield, making running and diving catches. Lynn ranks right up there with the best in the American League. Like the Red Sox, Carlton Fisk came on strong the last half of the year. Once free of early season nagging injuries, Pudge showed signs of returning to his 75 form offensively. And defensively. Of all the Red Sox players, none is scrappier than shortstop Rick Burleson. The rooster comes to play. Pound for pound, Burleson is one of the league's top performers. When it comes to hustle, Burleson doesn't have to take a back seat to anyone. In the field, he's got range and a rifle arm. Burleson's batting average was down to 225 in early July, but he refused to let it stay there. Rick started hitting to all fields. The adjustment worked. Over the last three months, Burleson batted 340 and finished with a 291 average, second only to Fred Lynn. First baseman Cecil Cooper, voted the most improved player in 1975, was even better in 76. Coop batted 282, 
and his quick, ripping swing connected for 15 homers and 78 runs batted in. The 26-year-old Texan does the job at first base and he does it with style. The 3-2-3 double play may be one of the toughest to make. Cecil Cooper continued to show with his bat and glove that he'll be around for a while. After a slow start, Jim Rice once again showed awesome power. He hit 25 home runs with some tremendous shots to finish among the league leaders. The result of a Jim Rice swing. Dwight Evans is one of the best right fielders in the American League. Perhaps Dwight's biggest asset is his amazingly accurate throwing arm, which produced 15 assists. The Red Sox had superb defensive outfield strength, and one of the reasons was Rick Miller. Miller made some fantastic catches at the expense of some of the better hitters in the league. Thurman Munson. Ben Ogilvy. And Lee May. Rick Miller, the unsung hero of the Red Sox. Rookie third baseman Butch Hobson made his presence felt. Given the chance to play regularly, he showed his defensive abilities and power potential with his bat. Butch Hobson, a promising young third baseman. Control pitcher Rick Wise. In 1976, he pitched brilliantly in spots, tossing two one-hitters and finishing second to Louis Tiant in victory. Fergie Jenkins found a home in Fenway and was coming on strong until late in the year when he suffered an Achilles tendon injury. He's expected to return to form in 77. Hard-throwing Reggie Cleveland became a starter the last half of the season and was consistently tough, winding up with 10 victories in 14 starts. Fenway Park, the left field wall, the closeness of the crowd, two of the many ingredients which breed excitement and so many great games. A truly unique part. Henry Aaron, the all-time home run king, now retired, played in a lot of ballparks during his career, and yet he talks about Fenway in a special way. Well, the fans have been just wonderful. Uh, you know, they're typical uh, baseball fans, and uh, they've always treated me nice. Uh, and coming to Boston, of course, you, you look out at that green monster out there, and. Uh, I just wish that I probably could have wished I could have played my whole career right here in this ballpark. New York Yankee catcher Thurman Munson looks at Fenway Park another way. I mean, first of all, I never, especially when the Yankees and the Red Sox get together, there's a lot of uh, uh, intenseness, a lot of pressure that's uh, you know really put on you by the park. It's a small ballpark, but really everything's close together, and it seems like 35,000 you know Red Sox fans makes about 70,000 of them. Anybody else? So I think uh, uh, you know because of the dimensions of the park, because of, uh, of the fans, because of the fine ball club that the Red Sox do have, it, there's just a lot of you know pressure still on you that you know really don't have to do with the baseball game. Fenway Park even does something to the managers who make the scene. Baltimore's colorful Earl Weaver knows Fenway well, and that it can be fatal to try to protect the slim lead. The crowd uh, here in Fenway is another factor. It seems that. Uh, most of the time when the Orioles have come in over the last nine years, it's been uh, mostly full, and it's a boisterous crowd, a crowd that's close to the playing field, uh, an enjoyable place for the fans to watch it because they seem to be right on top of the action, and the fans here seem to, to be part of the action, and uh, they can sway an umpire's decision one way or another, and uh, it's very seldom that I can remember getting the close calls in Fenway or either in Yankee Stadium for that matter, but that also makes it a park unique in itself. 
The Red Sox ended the season on a high note. They won 15 of the last 18 games and exceeded Don Zimmer's goal of a 500 season. They finished in third place. It wasn't an easy year, a 10-game losing streak, the injury to Bill Lee, the passing away of owner Tom Yawkey, a change in managers, the loss of Ferguson Jenkins, all took its toll. But the Red Sox left the field after the final game with their heads high, looking forward to 1977.